Well, hello, everybody. I'm here to uh, moderate the last panel. I'm Scott Sklar, and I have a company that blends all these clean energy technologies together, so I love this panel. I also have two uh, buildings in Arlington, Virginia, that are totally off the grid, uh, which I give tours two blocks from the Clarendon Metro stop, and um, with a blend of a lot of the technologies that are going to be talked about today. I want to say that it is, I've done 127 zero energy buildings, meaning they use no energy from the grid, uh, all over the world. Most of them not dinky ones like I have in Arlington that are two stories, but to eight to 25 stories. And it is able to be done. The technologies exist. The companies exist. Um, it is really creating uh, local will and standards to, to drive into that direction. So we have a great panel. And uh, the, the approach of our panel, just to remind the panelists, are about five minutes, because I really want to get to some Q&A. And so uh, Katrin Klingenberg, co-founder, executive director of the Passive House Institute US, acronym PHIUS, P-H-I-U-S, is our first speaker. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Woof. Thank you. you got it. It could be Fias. All right. Sorry. I think you're on. You, I would speak a little louder, though, just to give it a little zip. Is the mic on? Yeah. Uh -huh. Is there a, like a little light flashing or something? Now it's on? Haha. -ha. Here we go. Technology. So good. Um, all right, great. Um, so uh, thank you for being here with us, uh, last panel of the day. Um, hopefully uh, it's going to be a good one. Um, passive building has been my main focus for the last, whatever, 15 years almost now. And uh, I'm still with it. It's uh, um, a passion. Uh, Scott, like you, I can um, point to as many buildings, but uh, I totally agree that uh, the passive building technology has come a long way. So it's not a new thing, has been around for quite a while. But I'm happy to report that um, we are now really zooming in on really great tools, really great components that make um, passive buildings really possible on a mass scale. And that's what we are working on. We're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. Our main focus and mission is to make passive building mainstream. And when we were uh, founded, our goal was by 2020. So I guess we have to kind of like hurry up a little bit. But um, right now, the trend looks really, really good. Um, we have now uh, certified and pre-certified uh, passive buildings. We do certifications, quality assurance for passive buildings. We uh, have crossed the one million square foot mark in the United States. And um, when, if you count all the pro projects into that, uh, that have been um, kind of submitted to us, then we are already uh, at like 2.5 million uh, in this country. So uh, what, what, what is this thing, the passive building uh, concept, or uh, what uh, distinguishes it? It's really not rocket science. We have, as far as I'm concerned, no technology challenges left anymore. We have a fabulous panel here. Uh, all the components that we need to make these ultra-low load uh, buildings possible, we have them. Uh, there are really uh, five main principles that constitute a passive building. You need a really good uh, envelope shell in terms of insulation. Uh, you need a really good airtight layer so that you don't lose energy through leaks um, and um, that also your building envelope is durable, you don't have any moisture problems. Uh, you need really, really good window and door components um, and um, once we build the building really airtight, you also need a heat recovery energy uh, ventilator so that when you ventilate a building, you're not just throwing the energy out the door uh, that you've just generated, um, sometimes with fossil fuels. Um, and then last but not least, uh, if you do it all right, um, then uh, you only have to have a very, very tiny mechanical system. Like we, we used to joke, like you can heat your hair, uh, your house with a hair dryer, basically. That's the idea. You, you essentially almost eliminate the, um, the mechanical system that is still needed to um, keep your house comfortable. Um, um, so h how is the Passive uh, uh, House Institute helping to facilitate that? We just recently got into the standard setting business. Um, we developed climate-specific passive building standards for all the varying climates in the United States. 
And the purpose of that one is, so anybody can build a zero energy home, right? Like, so where, where can we help? Uh, we help with um, these uh, design guidelines that guide the designer towards um, the cost optimized uh, point between conservation uh, uh, of the envelope and then where do you start with your renewables? And that's exactly what these um, standards do for the designer. Uh, buildings built to the passive building standard uh, save approximately 70% overall energy, and that of course translates into the equivalent carbon savings. Uh, and once you build your shell to these very energy efficient standards, then only a very tiny uh, renewable system is necessary to take you to zero energy or even further to source zero, and that's really where we should be. So nationwide, we have seen uh, quite a bit of incentive and policy uh, progress. Uh, the affordable housing sector has been especially interested in the passive building uh, principle because, of course, when they uh, own the buildings, they retain the savings. And uh, so we have seen in the last couple of years, two years actually, uh, really the hockey stick in terms of certifications from the affordable housing sector driven by them. Um, and that's a very exciting development to see. So nationwide, um, I would say we're set up uh, to really make this a go. We need political will now uh, to take this to mainstream. And um, with that, I think uh, we have a fabulous panel here uh, of uh, folks who uh, can help to make this happen in a very cost-effective uh, way. Thank you, Katrin. Our next speaker, let's give Katrin a applause there, that's good. Uh, we have uh, Paul Bertram from Kingspan. Kingspan's an interesting company because it's a blended technology deliverer. So they have um, um, building envelope, they have uh, solar and uh, electricity and daylighting, they have LEDs, so it's a multi-technology provider. So I'm glad, Paul, you're, you're willing to come today and be at our panel. Take it over. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, as you say, uh, we're multi uh, portfolio based for all energy efficiency. Uh, one thing wasn't mentioned is we do under air floor systems for data centers, so we really cover a wide gamut of uh, energy efficient solutions for both uh, new construction and, and retrofit. Uh, we're headquartered here in North America in uh, Florida in the Daytona Beach area, and um, uh, we have operations in Canada, U.S., and Mexico that uh, basically I do environment sustainability and government affairs for. So ACEEE has some data out that says that it would cost 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour saved to implement an, a successful energy efficiency uh, program. And they go on to say that that's a whole lot cheaper than building new power plants. So what they're really telling us is that energy efficiency is, is a really big missed opportunity. And clear back in 2007, the McKinsey uh, quarterly report called the cost curve for greenhouse gas reduction showed that building insulation was one of the most cost efficient ways that we could reduce um, demand side energy uh, with uh, greenhouse gases. So one of the things that I believe uh, is really missing out of the whole picture is uh, a focus on envelope first. And um, take this statistic. There are approximately 5 million commercial buildings comprising 70 billion square feet in the United States, of which approximately 60 to 70 percent were built prior to 1980, uh, or the market release of low-E glass. And we have another panelist that will speak to that a bit. Uh, so over 50% of the building's interior loads are impacted by how the envelope performs. So we're seeing an awful lot of um, interest in, in the interiors. I'll speak to that in just a second. But we're not seeing enough attention to the envelope. And part of that is because of the long-term paybacks compared to things like lighting and uh, heating and cooling. So that is one of the policy areas that is going to have to be addressed. How do we how do we look for longer term uh, incentive programs, how, however that might shape out. But the energy efficiency sectors really providing effective uh, results in reducing demand side energy, but you're hearing again with LEDs, improved HVAC systems and building controls. And there's some recent surveys out there, EIA just uh, released some data from the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey and found that uh, consumption had been reduced uh, about 
uh, 12%. Uh, this was based on 2012 data. And again, lighting and space heating were the biggest resources of reduction. And Johnson Controls just had their uh, energy efficiency uh, program a few weeks ago, and their survey is finding that there's an awful lot of interest from the building owners in investing in energy efficiency areas, and it's at an all-time high. Uh, they did a survey, and uh, they're seeing a, a pretty significant increase in interest in this area. But again, no specific mention of the building envelope where some of the energy savings were. Uh, another surprise in energy consumption in the U.S. is the president asked American businesses to make a climate change pledge, and we're seeing companies responding to that in a big way and committing to reducing demand-side energy and related greenhouse gases. And as an example, Kingspan is mandated to be net zero energy by 2020. And um, so we're seeing lots of uh, companies participating in that, well-known names that you're familiar with, IKEA, Walmart, and, and lots of others. So going back to the issue of financing, uh, the, the challenge again is in the ROI and the, and the net present value for a sound business case here. So we did, a, we did a project in Boston a few years back. I spoke about it last year, but it's worth mentioning again. It was a 500 unit existing multifamily housing public um, uh, project we did 192 units. Uh, they were three seven-story mid-rises, and this cladding just went right over top of the existing brick. Brick here, cladding there. And um, basically, the cladding itself, not counting the windows or any of the uh, ventilation side of it, which was all dealt with, uh, the, the opaque envelope accounted for a 30% improvement over baseline. Overall, the project delivered 52% improvement they had actually predicted 72%, but that's another story. Um, uh, the, the key clue there was they didn't do commissioning, so that's very important, which Passive House would require you to do. I also want to speak to the advantages of, a, of um, advanced manufacturing systems. So this is just one uh, hybrid system. There's lots of them out there, and what I mean by that is they're manufactured off-site, they're taken out, and they're put up. They're not built one component and then another component and then another component on the job site. With the labor shortages we have, we're finding a lot of uh, latent defects in the construction. Buildings aren't performing to the level that they were designed for. And um, so there's a lot of benefits in bringing these types of systems out. Uh, much faster uh, construction times, uh, less waste, um, less trades, less latent defects. So one of the things also that's happening out there, uh, and this is somewhat of a debate, is mandating or uh, should it be voluntary benchmarking? And so by benchmarking, I mean in the larger cities, we're interested in knowing what these older buildings are using in energy. We want to know who are the energy hogs and at what level. When were they built? We can tell whether they have insulation in them, whether they don't have insulation in them. And by benchmarking, then you can figure out where you're going to get the biggest return on investment on recladding or updating the building. So um, there's projects like the City Energy Project, where um, 15 cities now have benchmarking disclosure laws. Um, and in some cases, uh, we're seeing uh, Architecture 2030 districts, which is a voluntary program. So we're seeing a mix of this. But uh, as of the summer of 2015, the city of Orlando made an $18 million energy efficiency investment in public buildings. And they did these audits on 55 municipal buildings. And at the completion of the project, the city will save up to $2.5 million per year in energy cost. And the savings will help pay for the cost of a new police headquarters that's currently in construction. So these are the kinds of things that you can also benefit from. Um, Paul, you have one minute. Yep, I'm, I'm all done. So the, it, we, we need tax reform for the financing. Uh, we need a few policies just on high performance building. And we're glad to see the <coughs> conference taking place on the energy bill. Thank you so much.
Now, thank you. The one thing that bothers me crazy as I deal with my commercial clients on picking technologies, when we talk about window building envelopes, we're talking about the outer part of the building, the roof, the sides, the of course, the windows. And so they'll put in insulation, and, and you're trying to increase the R value, the insulating value, and they don't change out the windows that may have an R1, have no insulating value. It makes me furious. So I'm really glad that Intus is here, <laughs> and Ormus Sabulis, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, it did. Unbelievable, is here to talk about what makes me so angry to reduce my blood pressure. Go thank for you, it. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. My name is Aramis Sabulis. I'm a principal at Intus Windows. We're manufacturers of super energy efficient windows and door systems. And I guess this is the panel where you bring your toys, right? I love toys. <laughs> Go for it. Um, as some of the panelists previously has mentioned, uh, in the United States we have about 5 million commercial buildings and they actually contribute to about 45 to 50 percent of green, greenhouse gas emission. So that's a huge, huge problem that we're facing and smallest improvement in the commercial buildings especially can impact our planet significantly. Now, the interesting fact is that those 5 million buildings that we're talking about, they're probably 99% of them, they have aluminum windows. And this is the weakest link in the building envelope. This is the low-hanging fruit for all of us. So Aluminum windows and single pane. Exactly. With holes in them. Right. And even double pane, right? So, so these... Here. Anyway, go, sorry. <laughs> so other than structural performance, the aluminum windows uh, do not bring anything uh, else to the building in terms of the extra sound insulation and better comfort. So what Intus is doing is we're really changing the market, as cliched as it was sound, one window at a time. And I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a little bit more details to it. So we're manufacturing a steel-reinforced polymer window. This window costs approximately the same as double-pane generic aluminum window, but outperforms that window by three times. Three times, no extra cost, mm. right? Um, and we have a lot of great examples. We've installed these units in numerous passive house projects, residential, commercial applications, especially there's a uh, multiple affordable housing, uh, passive house projects happening in Pennsylvania, and they're using these systems because they're affordable and because they perform to the passive house level. So what we've done for the last few years, we said, well, these windows perform significantly better than anything that we've seen, not only in the passive house, but why don't we take them to a uh, mainstream markets, market rate buildings, and we'll see what happens then. So just in our backyard, three years ago, we finished, um, we were a part of one uh, project. Uh, it was a capital city charter school retrofit project. It's a 160,000 square feet facility, and they were doing a retrofit. By the way, they did not do anything with the building envelope. They did not insulate that. They just did the interior finishes. And we were able to actually convince an architect and general contractor, instead of using double pane aluminum windows, to use these uh, triple pane polymer system windows. And you know what happened? This building now saves $70,000 annually without really paying anything extra initially. So kids are getting much more comfortable classrooms. Uh, they, they've increased sound insulation tremendously, so the, 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 the efficiency of, of kids studying in those classrooms improves significantly as well. Now, this building also, we've calculated that the carbon footprint reduction, because of the switching uh, to triple pane polymer windows, was 877 metric tons. When I hear the metric tons, carbon dioxide metric tons, I never really could connect the dots. Right. But some statistics you might probably not have known, one tree can absorb up to 48 pounds of carbon dioxide a year only. So what that 877 metric tons really mean is equivalent to 40,000 trees a year. So that's only one improvement that did not cost them anything. 
that's equivalent to 40,000 trees. So we've done a lot of other projects similar to these in multifamily buildings where instead of double pane aluminum, we brought in triple pane polymer systems. So what we are trying to really say here is if you do enough research, if you, if you look at the products out there, you can significantly improve your buildings, not only residential, but also on a commercial scale and make a huge impact to our planet. Here, Thank here. You. I, I want to point out I'm an adjunct professor at George Washington University. I teach two interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy. And I tell my students it is always less expensive to save energy than generate it from any source. So it is always less expensive to save energy. And that's what we have here. So now we're moving into systems in the building. And so we have Ultimate Air, which I love the name of that company, Ultimate Air. And Luke Langals, did I pronounce that right? That was pretty close. Pretty yeah. close? I'm Luke Langhaus. I'm from Ultimate Air. Go for it. All right. Mm -hmm. Director of Business Development. I've been with Ultimate Air for four years. We've been a United States manufacturer for over 20. He has 20. facial hair, too, which is, is very impressive to me. Anyway. I like yours, too. No, so. you don't want to go that <laughs> way. <laughs> So we've been a U.S. manufacturer for a long time. We focus only in the high-performance building sector, which means we only build products for passive house and similar building styles. Um, we build energy recovery ventilation systems right now. Um, we've had ours on the market for over 15 years. Uh, the, this technology is basically an ex interior exterior ventilation machine, bringing in fresh air and removing the interior air, but without wasting your energy. Um, it comes with a heat recovery medium in it. I don't want to get too technical, um, but Good, basic you're on Capitol Hill, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it basically is like having your windows open in the middle of winter, but without wasting your heat. I mean, that's the idea. In a passive house style construction or net zero energy, um, this becomes important because we tighten these houses up to save energy. We do better air sealing, better insulation, better windows, and naturally our buildings do not infiltrate air anymore. These windows right here are letting in fresh air constantly, no matter what time of year it is. Um, so in this room, maybe not as important, but as we would make a building like this a little more energy efficient, we would require a system like this. Um, from Ultimate Air's standpoint, we, we get to work in almost every green building certification there is. I mean, we've been doing this a long time. So Energy Star, LEED, um, Living Building Challenge, Green Globe, Passive House, uh, all of these programs are fantastic for bringing green building to the masses and to everybody. Uh, we find Passive House to be the best solution to do a market affordable, energy efficient building. Uh, this means that in our experience with all the projects we've done, which is every, we've done projects in every 50 states, we got thousands of units in operation, so we've seen them all, but Passive House really brings the best bang for the buck. And I'd like to give an example of a project we did in Virginia um, that was built for $5 per square foot less than the building next door of the exact same size and uses 60% less energy. So this type of construction doesn't always have to be super expensive, and I think that's a big misconception in the industry. When people look at green building, they think solar panels, which are great, and all these other technologies, and they think added cost, added cost, added cost. Who pays for that cost? Is it the building owner, the government? Who's gonna do this? But I think if we look at the experts we have in the United States, practicing right now, you'll find that a lot of these projects aren't costing any more to do. Yes, you have to add ventilation and windows and all these other things, but you save from other standpoints of the building. Um, the key is just to look at it from the design standpoint when you start designing a building and accept that energy use is gonna have to be one of the criteria you use when going into that design, which anybody who builds Passive House, Net Zero, Lead Platinum can tell you, design it that way up front. Don't try to add it on later. Here, here. Good point. Which leads into our last <clears throat> speaker. And so this is Zender America Inc. with John Rockwell. Hi, Scott. Imagine, if you will, the difficulty of being the last presenter in the last panel, preceded by a ventilation person. So uh, 
I will amplify what Lucas said about the importance of uh, ventilation in low energy buildings. What I found so stimulating about working in buildings that have um, that really achieve extraordinary energy goals is that the interrelationship of all the systems, whether it's ventilation or fenestration or envelope, <clears throat> all those things have become uh, you become very dependent on the other. Uh, on the other professions. What I do want to say what distinguishes Zender America from a lot of other ventilation companies is that we offer not just the box that is the heat exchanger, but we offer the entire system of distribution of air for that. Uh, a lot of ventilation companies use the ERV or HRV and tie it to the existing ductwork for forced hot air or air conditioning systems, and we believe in decoupling that so that when you don't have the heating season or the cooling seasons, shoulder seasons for instance, you still have a dedicated decoupled source of high efficiency heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation. It works flawlessly. Our system has a, uh, a small tubular system that fits right inside cavity walls, stud walls, or under slabs, and it uh, really directs air where it needs to go. So if you extract air continuously from bathrooms and kitchens, as you are required to do by code, either intermittently or in our case continuously 24-7, you then supply air in the same exact amount to places where you need that. That's generally in bedrooms. At nighttime with windows and doors closed, CO2 levels can spike unless you provide fresh air. So most people who find the room stuffy will open the window at night. That's great in Honolulu or San Diego or Costa Rica, but it's not necessarily good in places that are dominated by heating and cooling. To be able to control. Or if there are safety, security, and noise issues, it's nice to be able to leave the windows closed. The, uh, the myth of you can't open a window in a passive house is just that. You can open it if you'd like, but you'd use the criteria of how, when you'd open a window. If there is a street sweeper going by twice a week, you might not do that because of the dust that might come in. Or if it's an unsafe lower floor urban neighborhood. Or if there's a lot of pollen about. But a filtered ventilation system uh, is a great way to actually increase the indoor air quality to exceed that which is outside your building and a dedicated decoupled system to do so with efficiencies approaching 95% of whatever that temperature difference is, is an extraordinary way to achieve that. So. And I think the other issue, as we have been tightening up buildings, meaning putting more insulation and better windows, uh, that you have outgassing in buildings, you have chemicals yeah. that you use to clean your buildings yeah. and your dishes and your laundry and, other, and coming out of your carpeting and your Pets. furniture. <laughs> And you do not want that stuck in your building. You want that the hell out. You want it moving. And so this is a technology that will make you not only save you energy, but make you healthier. And if you're my age, you know, you want to look healthy. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions. Anybody have questions? Here's your chance. Ask a question. Go for it. Nothing? Oh, there. Good. Um, I, 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 so I understand the concept of passive house, but how do you also incorporate... Uh, smart technologies to ensure that passive living experience where residents don't have to be worried about having them actually tinker with all the settings. You, you two are instrumented, correct? Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about we have lots of different control. Sorry, we have lots of different control options available. Um, we've done CO2 control, meaning that the more people you have in your house, the ventilation system's naturally going to ramp itself up and down. Um, ventilation's always going to cost some form of money, even though ours are going to be very efficient. So we're going to be the least. Um, we still want to make sure we're not over, over ventilating when we don't need to. So as far as a smart home goes, we can do motion sensors, um, CO2 control. We're looking at VOC. Um, control to basically boost the ventilation when you need it. Um, that's the most important thing uh, as far from a fresh air standpoint. Uh, I, very similar in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the thing I would add is um, with respect to bringing fresh air that's cold in in wintertime and exhausting moist air, you oftentimes can have condensate buildup and what you want to prevent uh, is frost from happening. So frost protection is a key ingredient of any ventilation system. Uh, it varies in how manufacturers do that. Sometimes people ramp down the supply fresh air intake, preserve the outgoing uh, exhaust air. However, that will depressurize a building. I'm not sure if that's a foreign topic to anybody, but if you suck more than you blow, you may withdraw fumes from combustion appliances or fireplaces or dryers or things like that. Not so much a problem with a dryer. Um, uh, begin, becoming more aware of temperature sensors that monitor when that's going to happen so the system automatically stays in balance and can control frost protection is one way. Another is uh, humidity management, uh, humidistats. And we're moving into, you, you, you saw uh, Google buying Nest thermostats as an example. Yeah. And the, re the reason they're doing that, obviously, is they want to get into your home and how you, how you handle yourself. But in fact, it's setting the stage for a user-friendly 
approach to how you control your heating, your cooling, and, uh, and lots of other appliances. And we are just at the, we are in the infancy of this, but it's a very exciting point of view. I just want to amplify what Kat said earlier, and that is a low energy, high performance building is not a geeky, smart building. It's just better envelope, better windows, better everything. You don't have to think about it any differently, but you will experience comfort that you never knew before. And it really, most people don't care about the energy efficiency and the watts per CFM and things like that. They want to know that they're not going to have a chill in their neck when they sit next to a single glazed window, really. That's what it boils down to. Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to add to um, keep it simple is really the trick. Um, so I forgot to mention uh, the passive building standard also adds the comfort criteria, as you said, right? It keeps it always comfortable in the whole building. It also adds resilience. So we're insulating to a level where the building essentially can be like just by itself. It's so simple and passive that it can actually uh, exist without all the complex technologies. And actually, um, uh, studies have shown that if somebody temp uh, tinkers with the thermostat or even a Nest thermostat that would adjust to your behavior, uh, that would result in higher energy consumption than if you left it alone in a very well-designed passive building. Yeah, that, that actually proved out in the reclad that I was talking about. The, the new boiler systems um, allowed thermostats, programmable thermostats in each, each quarters, uh, where before it was set at the, at the boiler and everybody got the same thing. Old habits are hard to break. They were still regulating by opening windows and closing them, and that caused the building. That was part of that differentiation from 52% to 72%. None of these guys put in electric shock stuff that would prevent that, sadly. Yeah. Any, I, any other questions? I, I just also wanted to just mention on that topic that we're, are, we are seeing sensors being put in, at least in the commercial side, and they're collecting big data, which all goes back to the benchmarking thing as well. It doesn't really regulate, like you said, but it's, it is recording data so that we can understand how buildings are performing. I want to move to the next question. You got it? Uh, this should be a pretty quick question, but I was wondering if passive house is mostly for residential or if you ever apply to residential. <laughs> yeah, that's a quick one. Uh, it's, it's good for everything. It's good for new build, for retrofit, for commercial, for residential. We're seeing everything. Uh, uh, really I've done like industrial size, so all, yeah, all, you can do it. Exactly, like uh, production facilities, not a problem. Um, we are seeing high rises, um, um, uh, medical facilities, everything. Any other question? Yes. Um, the the envelope for the passive house, it's a uh, wood frame still, um, stuff, or is it? Uh, Hay bale, uh, igloo. Uh, it's not a material. It's an energy use. It doesn't matter what you use. It's 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 restricting airflow and exfiltration and making sure you have enough R value depending on your climate. So you have sense. a lot of variety is the yeah. answer. So, so you set the R value. Right, so, so think of it as like a, um, a miles per gallon for a building, right? Uh, so you, you have that goal and then you design the envelope to meet that goal and it doesn't really matter what material you use, yeah, at least it's a work sound with, practice. You know, you can do it. Do you want to go to mm -hmm. foam? You can Bob do Bale, it. anything. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's give a round of applause for this great panel. Thank you all. Thank you.